Now the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Tuesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Andrew Johnson of National Review in for Jim Garrity today. Every school within, oh, I probably a 50-mile radius at least is closed around Washington, D.C. today as a result of snow that I don't think quite met the expectations, Andrew. But uh, for folks who aren't familiar with the way Washington, D.C. works when snow's about to come, they don't wait to actually see what's going to happen. They cancel school a day ahead of time. That's what happened today, and they probably would have canceled it anyway because a, a few flakes will do that. My girlfriend recently moved here from Minneapolis. She's, she's from that part of the country. She <laughs> moved here a few months ago, and uh, she, she's kind of shaking her head uh, when when I talked to her last night about, like, come on, guys, this is nothing. Uh, <laughs> so, so I said, well, welcome to D.C. snow weather. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> well, as, as a Michigan native, uh, it, it, it is appalling to watch this, this area do what it does when, when snow arrives. But having been here as long as I have, Unfortunately, I've slowly gotten used to it, but it's always good to have rational upper Midwestern people uh, explaining how the world really works uh, in these sorts of events. I don't think people in Boston would have much sympathy for us today, for example. Exactly. (laughs) So anyway, on to the good, bad, and crazy martinis today. We start with the good, and this is a judicial decision that seemed to come down in the middle of the night, but whatever, we'll take it. A federal judge in South Texas on Monday temporarily blocked President Barack Obama's executive action on immigration, giving a coalition of 26 states... Time to pursue a lawsuit that aims to permanently stop the orders. U.S. District Judge Andrew Hanen's decision comes after a hearing in Brownsville in January and puts on hold Obama's orders that could spare as many as 5 million people who are in the U.S. illegally from deportation. Hanen wrote in a memorandum accompanying his order that the lawsuit should go forward and that without a preliminary injunction, the states will suffer irreparable harm in the case, saying the genie would be impossible to put back in the bottle. So, Andrew... The White House, of course, saying this is totally legal. But the good news is, is not only that this will go forward and the states have at least a shot of winning this case, but it's also a shot in the arm for the uh, Department of Homeland Security funding debate that's quickly running out of time upon Capitol Hill. First off, this is almost perfectly typecast for the governor of Texas. You know, I, I just don't know what it is about Texas governors always getting these, you know, being involved in these juicy cases and always being <laughs> able to sort of be the knight in shining armor that comes in to save the day on these things. But it definitely makes things interesting. I mean, I think you had a lot of sort of deflated conservatives, even when it came to the DHS funding hoping it would work out, but not knowing if it ultimately would. This sort of validates what they're doing, may put some wins in, in, at, at, at their back, and just validates that argument and makes it maybe even harder for, for the White House to argue. Well, I guess we'll see how the president and Congress uh, evaluate the, the judge's decision. My guess is it probably won't budge the positions too much, but uh, one can always hope. And the other thing with these is, you know, it, it, it's a victory today, but we'll probably still be talking about this, you know, a year and a half, two years from now, <laughs> just just the way these legal things go. Exactly. All right. The bad martini is one that actually broke on Monday. I like the way that Ed Morrissey over at Hot Air terms this. There are newspaper corrections that sincerely intend to repair the record. And then there are the New York Times corrections to columns that should have never run in the first place. On Friday, the paper of record published a Gail Collins essay blaming Scott Walker's cuts to education funding in Wisconsin for teacher layoffs that took place in 2010. There were only two problems with the column. Scott Walker didn't take office until 2011, and his public employee union reforms actually prevented cuts that would have resulted in even more K-12 through layoffs. Either of those could have been easily checked but would have been obvious to anyone who paid the least bit of attention to the controversy in Wisconsin over the last four years. This is the extent of the correction, which obviously was not blaring on page one. An earlier version of this column incorrectly stated that teacher layoffs in Milwaukee in 2010 happened because Governor Scott Walker, quote, cut state aid to education, unquote. The layoffs were made by the city's school system because of a budget shortfall before Mr. Walker took office in 2011. Ed Morrissey then goes into the whole point about the second mistake with the column, and that's that Scott Walker prevented more job losses when it came to teacher layoffs. So uh, not exactly equal treatment here between the column and the correction. Yeah, well, well first off, welcome to frontrunner status, uh, Scott Walker. <laughs> but the next part is, I mean, this is going to be sort of par for the course, and, and it, it kind of reminds me of where where perception is just more important. And and just the idea that people know that Scott Walker and teachers and education and this sort of fits in line with the narrative, never mind that it was before he even took office. It just kind of it just kind of perpetuates that idea that some people have, even if they don't know the details. Similar to me, 
like the Christie Bridgegate scandal. Um, I think there are a lot of people going into 2016, you know, assuming Christie runs, assuming Walker runs, that again they won't know all the details, but there's just sort of this cloud around them that that instances like this, that something in the New York Times uh, perpetuates it and 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 just reminds people of of I guess perhaps the less nice qualities of these of these guys even if they're not wholly based in uh in reality this time it's scott walker's turn you know everyone else i don't know mike pence get ready one of, you're <laughs> gonna get one of these or uh everyone's gonna kind of get one of these and uh here's scott walker's jim garrity likes to call this the spaghetti throwing stage of a campaign when liberals will just throw anything out there hoping something will stick to the wall and this is already number three for walker even before he was making obvious overtures about a presidential run. There was that whole allegation that he was illegally collaborating with special interest groups during the first election campaign in 2010. That turned out to be bogus and politically motivated. Then there's this whole non-story about uh, not having a college degree. He wasn't a bum. He was actually helping out his family. And now, of course, uh, this embarrassing correction that the Times has to make because the whole premise of their story is bogus. So (laughs) you have to wonder what's left in the spaghetti bowl. But I'm sure uh, if Walker still proves to be a viable candidate, uh, they'll find something. Like you said, there's sort of the non-story with his college degree and I can't remember whether it's the Washington Post or someone had the whole look into his college years and deep dive. And that that's what fueled his political ambition from such a young age. It's sort of his turn and they're all going to kind of get their run at it. But uh, I guess he's staying afloat. So so we'll see what happens. He even survived a you know, college years profile. That's true. Um, I would like to see, though, I'm just thinking it'd be really fun to see someone come out with a college age like profile of some candidate. But it to be like very dull and boring <laughs> and we're like, oh, he just always went to class class and cleaned up his room and it was actually pretty boring uh, <laughs> rather than try and make it like these big epic personality defining eras of their life yeah exactly well we had Mitt Romney allegedly being a bully in high school then we had the Jeb Bush uh, allegedly being a bully in, in high school so I guess we've cleared the college years for Scott Walker we'll see what his high school record was like that... yeah what I liked about the Jeb Bush one though was like he was both a bully but also a burnout and so it was like <laughs> very unmotivated to me it kind of I kind of didn't get it <laughs> <laughs> oh man uh, if you had Obama's high school uh, record there it probably looked like a Cheech and Chong movie for the most part <laughs> but, uh, on to uh, the crazy martini now Andrew today the White House is kicking off a Three-day summit on how to counter violent extremism. The words Islamic extremism will not be used, however, because why would they? Chris Matthews, even over at MSNBC, is starting to ask some hard questions about the fact that we keep seeing these ISIS videos of the brutal murder of people, uh, from the Jordanian pilot being set on fire to the beheading of the 21 Coptic Christians. Now there's reports of 45 Iraqis in al-Baghdadi who were burned to death simultaneously. There's the one that's uh, being reported on about kids in a cage potentially being incinerated. And Marie Harf, of course, one of the State Department spokespeople, she was on Hardball last night. And uh, it's kind of fun watching Chris Matthews lose his patience with the spin from this administration. But to her credit, Marie Harf has her talking points in order. They're just really, really bad talking points. Well, how do we win? How do we stop this? They can keep finding places where they can hold executions and putting the camera work together, getting their props ready and killing people for show. And nothing we do right now seems to be directed at stopping this. But we cannot win this war by killing them. We cannot kill our way out of this war. We need in the longer term, medium and longer term, to go after the root causes that leads people to join these groups, whether it's lack of opportunity for jobs. We're not going to be able to stop that in our lifetime or 50 lifetimes. There's always going to be poor people. There's always going to be poor Muslims. And as long as there are poor Muslims, the trumpet's blowing. They'll join. We can't stop that. We can work with countries around the world to help improve their governance. We can help them build their economy so they can have job opportunities for these people. Andrew, we've got a fairly high real unemployment rate. I believe we've got about 47 million people in poverty. As far as I know, most of those people haven't turned to uh, beheading people and setting others on fire as a result of their frustration. No, oh, exactly. And this is how you know Chris Matthews is unsatisfied because you, you got, you've seen the meme of you know his arms crossed on the night of the midterms. <laughs> if people watch the video, that's how Chris Matthews is sitting. You know, it's midterms level of unsatisfaction with with what's happening in front of him. But I was talking to someone about again the administration and, and sort of just this line that they keep putting out and just their inability to really just want to admit what's going on. And it is just now getting weirdly stubborn. I mean, it's one thing I guess if you want to say they're holding on to 
lofty ideals or, or, or whatever it is, but, but just in the face of, you know, month after month, I mean, ISIS has been really sort of a front page issue since around June or July, we're coming up on a year now, and there's still sort of this contorting dialogue that they want to have. And again, you just sort of have to chalk it up to, I guess, stubbornness. I mean, it's not so much erudite or intellectual or, you know, just, they just sort of have a more worldly view of these things. They just can't let go. Do they eventually fold here? I mean, as long as we keep seeing these videos and, and Americans getting the idea that nothing's really being done to stop them. How long does this semantic game work for them? Well, I mean, again, even if their their sort of safe zone of MSNBC maybe isn't even warming up to them. I brought her up yesterday, and she actually did it again yesterday. Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard of Hawaii, she she again after after this weekend's atrocities, uh, again said this administration needs to come to terms with what we're dealing with. Uh, she's doing that now almost on a weekly basis. It feels like I don't know what why that would be any different than you know the other other people coming out and sort of criticizing what they've been doing but maybe if their own are are now sort of tapping them on their shoulder and saying guys come on wake up that that's when they fold otherwise i mean i guess marie harf's just going to stick to her talking points and try and find ways for 17 year olds to not pick up ak-47s and start their own business like she said like uh yeah yeah that, that was one of the things she said because we, we need to encourage these young men in the region to, to start their own businesses not pick up weapons against the united states and it's just sort of bizarre <laughs> I have no other words to add to that. Andrew, as always, it's great to have you with us. Glad you survived the uh, the snowpocalypse of... uh, Yeah, how many snowpocalypses are we on now? Yeah, I don't know. (laughs) It starts to lose its uh, buzz after a while, doesn't it? (laughs) Yeah. Anyway, talk to you soon. Thanks again. Take care. Thanks. Andrew Johnson of National Review. In for Jim Garrity today. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Jim and I should be back together on Wednesday for the next edition of the Three Martini Lunch.